how could I resist uh, not speaking at a, an event which is named after a mathematical calculation? So, um, when I was at school, uh, I was very frustrated by the fact that we had to make choices uh, in what we wanted to study. Either you could study uh, Shakespeare or the second law of thermodynamics or Rubens or relativity or Debussy or DNA. It was art or science. And I was deeply frustrated by this uh, uh, fact that we had to somehow choose between the two. And I really felt it was, a, in some sense, a, a false dichotomy. Uh, uh, at school, I was interested in things like um, music. I learned the trumpet, uh, doing theater. But I was also interested in, in working out the way the world works. Um, and as I carried on my studies, I chose to, to go the scientific route. But I still kept my interests, uh, interests in the arts. And um, the more and more I studied both of them, I realized that there's just so much correspondence between the two that both are somehow looking after the same sort of structures. And what I wanted to do in, in this talk was to choose um, uh, one of my favorite artists, actually a musician. I think there's a lot of correspondence between mathematics and music. Um, a musician who uh, both overtly and subconsciously uh, was drawn to very similar structures that I love as a mathematician. Uh, my secret mathematician is uh, a French composer called Olivier Messiaen. Um, he really was fascinated in mathematics and using mathematics in his music to create certain effects. Um, I'm going to concentrate on one little piece, which is one of my favorites, called the Quartet for the End of Time. This is a quartet that he wrote um, for four musicians, himself on the piano, when he was in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. Um, there was also a clarinetist, a violinist, and uh, a cellist. And uh, he wrote this piece. And uh, in the first movement, Liturgy de Crystal, he wanted to create a sense of timelessness in this piece. And to do this, he actually used um, some very important numbers in mathematics called prime numbers. And these are the indivisible numbers, ones you can't divide, numbers like uh, 7 or 17. And he used them very effectively to create this sense of timelessness. So I'm going to play you the piece in a little bit, but um, the, the opening. Um, it starts, actually, a connection with uh, one of the other talks, uh, Messiaen was obsessed with birdsong, not pigeons. I think he found them rather boring sort of sound. But, um, uh, but he used a lot of uh, bird sounds I in his music. So when the piece starts, you're going to hear uh, the clarinet and the violin uh, exchanging bird sounds. Um, but it's in the piano piece where you hear him using the mathematics to create this sense of timelessness. Um, so what he does is to use two prime numbers, the number 17 and the number 29. And uh, these are used in, in two different ways. So the, he has a, a rhythm sequence which was repeated um, every uh, 17 notes. But the harmonic sequence only repeats itself after 29 notes. Um, so when you get, uh, so here uh, you see, if you count the number of notes, you'll have 17 notes up to this red line. And then the, the rhythm repeats itself again. You start with crotchet, crotchet, crotchet. And then it goes off. And after the red line, you get crotchet, crotchet, crotchet again. But the harmonic sequence has only got about 2 thirds of the way through its sequence. And it only starts repeating itself after this point here, by which time the rhythm is a completely different place. So you get, he's using these primes in a deliberate way, such that they just keep out of sync of each other. And you get this side. So you don't really are aware of what's happening, but you ha get this sense of unease because the things just aren't meshing um, as the piano plays the piece. So let's listen to the beginning of the Liturgy de Cristal. So the rhythm is beginning to repeat itself, but the harmonic sequence in the piano is still working its way through its 29 notes. And then the harmonic sequence starts, but the rhythm is somewhere else completely. Uh, and this uh, has to repeat itself 17 times 29 times before you actually hear the thing repeat itself, by which time the piece has finished all completely. So by using these primes, Messiaen very deliberately, and he knew what he was doing, was creating the effect of this unease and sense of timelessness. 
And in fact, I think the reason that most musicians and mathematicians are drawn to things like these numbers is almost a sort of evolutionary survival. We have to spot patterns in order to survive in this world. And in fact, the first people to discover these primes are not mathematicians or musicians at all, but a strange little insect um, in the, which lives in the forest in North America. This little insect, it's a cicada, um, has a very strange life cycle, um, which evo involves this prime number that Messiaen used, the number 17. Um, the cicada stays underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. And then after 17 years, it emerges into the forest. Uh, almost on the same day, these things emerge. And they party away. They sing. This is the sound of one of these cicadas. You have to multiply this by about 100,000 of these things. The sound is so unbearable that residents move out of the area. It's un un unbelievably loud. Um, the cicadas eat the trees. They mate. They lay, lay eggs. And then after about six weeks, they all die. And the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years before the next brood appears from the ground. Now, it's absolutely amazing that they can count up to 17. There seems to be nothing in the natural cycle which has a 17-year period to it. Um, sunspots are 11-year cycle, but 17. Now, very curious, why is it chosen 17? Why does it evolve to have a 17-year life cycle? Is it just a coincidence that it's a prime number? Uh, well, it appears not. There's also another species in America which hides underground for 13 years and another which un hides underground for seven years. So seven, 13, 17, are all prime numbers. There seems to be something about these primes which is helping these cicadas. Um, we're not too sure what it is, but we have a hypothesis, and it's related to exactly the same thing as Messiaen was using to create this sense of asynchronicity in the piano piece. Because we think there might have been a predator that also used to appear periodically in the forest. And the cicada would kind of, the, kind of, the predator would try and appear when the cicada appeared, so it could wipe the cicadas out. Um, but the cicadas uh, that had uh, an, a prime number life cycle found that they could keep out of sync of the predator much better than those that had a non-prime number life cycle. So, for example, if the predator appears every six years and the cicada appears every nine years, then as you can see, they meet each other every 18 years, so they get wiped out very quickly. If the cicada appears every eight years, it does a little bit better, it gets to year 24, but if it uh, appears every seven years, um, then actually it does a lot better. It has uh, the, the same uh, idea as the, the rhythm and the harmony in the messiaen, the predator and the cicada now only meet for the first time in year 42. So although the cicada is appearing more often every seven years, by using the prime numbers, it's able to, to keep out of sync and avoid the predator. And it seems like in some of these forests, there was a real competition. You know, who knew their maths best? Uh, the, the predator was stupid, didn't know its maths. If you know maths in this world, you survive. So um, uh, it seems uh, they got up to 17, uh, which is one of the primes that Messian used. So you can see the similar sort of structures um, appearing both naturally and also being drawn to artistically uh, by Messiaen. Now, interestingly, Messiaen was, uh, knew his maths, and he very deliberately um, chose those primes in order to create this effect. But what I think is really striking is that very often an artist or a musician will be drawn to structures almost intuitively, subconsciously, aesthetically, because they feel there's something nice about them, um, which retrospectively have some incredible mathematical significance. And this happened to Messiaen in particular. He was one of the uh, composers who used the 12-tone system that Schoenberg developed, um, that trying to throw away sort of tonal music, making every 12 notes of the chromatic scale have an equal importance. And what you would do is you'd do a, a permutation of these 12 notes um, to create a 12-tone row, and um, so you were just sort of like uh, shuffling a pack of cards, and then you would read off the different orders. And in one piece that uh, Messiaen created, uh, which is for solo piano, called Il de Faux II, um, he used two different 12-tone uh, rows. Um, and you can consider these 12-tone rows as almost like um, a sort of symmetrical move on uh, these 12 notes. It's some sort of permutation that you do of the 12 notes. And um, the 12, two 12-tone 12, uh, rows that he chose, and he was drawn to them just because he felt that they, they interacted with each other in interesting ways. Um, uh, and he wrote this uh, piece using these two 12-tone rows. If you consider these two 
permutations mathematically as somehow uh, some sort of move on a symmetrical object with 12 faces, um, they actually create um, an incredible symmetrical object which you can't see physically. It lives in higher dimensional space. But it's a symmetrical object that we only discovered at the end of the 19th century were drawn to. It has incredibly special properties. It's called the Matteo Group of Order 12. It's one of the first very exceptional um, uh, symmetrical objects which are somehow in our periodic table of symmetry. But it, it's extremely striking to me that Messiaen was drawn to these purely for aesthetic reasons as something it had something interesting about it, um, which, although he wasn't the first to discover it, he discovered it in some sense independently, and it's one of the most important groups in our kind of periodic table of symmetry. So let me play you, and I can't show you this symmetrical object because it lives in higher dimensional space, but I can at least play it for you. So here's um, that symmetrical object um, heard through the ears. <laughs> I must admit, I prefer the mathematical version of it than the musical one. But, um, uh, but that's, I, I think it, it illustrates how a com uh, an artist will be drawn to things that I'm fascinated in just from a purely mathematical point of view. Um, but what's striking for me as well, as, as a mathematician, as I grew up as a mathematician, is how much aesthetics there is involved in the, the act of doing mathematics as well. The things that I'm drawn to mathematically are, are not just because they're true or have some relevance in explaining the world, but are often driven by aesthetics. One of the books I read um, when I was growing up as a mathematician was G.H. Uh, Hardy's A Mathematician's Apology, um, which is all about the creative art of doing mathematics. Um, here is uh, Hardy describing a mathematician like a painter or a poet as a maker of patterns. I am only interested in mathematics as a creative art. And uh, uh, I think uh, Graham Greene described this book as uh, one of the best examples of what it's like to be a creative artist. Um, and uh, I was quite struck by this when I read this uh, as a young student because I sort of, uh, you know, I was trying to marry these two things, my scientific view of the world and my artistic one. And for me, mathematics seemed to sit perfectly between the two as a bridge between something creative and something um, uh, that can help explain the world. And a, th a lot of the things that we choose to celebrate mathematically um, are not particularly useful. We do it, we choose them because they have some beauty and aesthetics about it. And actually reading a mathematical proof for me is very much like listening to a piece of music where themes are set up, begin to change, mutate, change into something else. One of my favorite theorems is this one due to uh, Pierre de Fermat, a famous um, uh, mathematician uh, from 300 years ago. Um, he, he showed that every prime number, which if you divide it by four has remained a one, that that prime number, there are infinitely many of them, can always be written as two square numbers added together. So for example, 41 divided by four have remained a one, can be written as two square numbers, 16 plus 25. Now, however big the number is, provided it has remained a one on division by four, you can always write it as two squares. Now, this is utterly surprising to me. What on earth has prime numbers got to do with two square numbers? And for me, the transformation that you see during that proof is like seeing a, a, a theme develop, change, and mutate into something else until you get this final chord, the QED, where you see um, the two sides of the equation sort of marry up. And for me, when I'm doing my mathematics, I don't expect you to understand any of what I've just put up there, but this is one of my proudest mathematical theorems. It's this discovery of a new symmetrical shape. Um, but for me, I could write down many different uh, symmetrical shapes out there, but it's about choice. I chose to celebrate this one, stand up in front of my peers, write about it in my journals, because it has an element of surprise, something, it has a story to it. Um, when you read the proof, you can't believe that the, what this is, has sort of encoded in it is really there. 
And it, for me, being a mathematician is a lot about choice. Uh, it's not just about truth. It's about choice and aesthetics and being drawn to things that, um, that have some beauty to them. And what's exciting is that very often that leads on to something which can be very useful. The primes that Fermat explored are actually now the key to the codes that are used on the internet. Fermat wasn't interested in that at all. He'd be very surprised, I think, to discover that. Um, here's a quote uh, by... Um, either an artist or a mathematician. I want you to try and think which one you, you think it is. Um, this person wrote, to create consists precisely in not making useless combinations. Invention is discernment, choice. The sterile combinations do not even present themselves to the mind of the inventor. So I wonder how many people think that that's an, an artist talking about what they're doing? A few artists. How many think it's a scientist talking about what they're doing? How many people are not sure? Because it could be either, maybe. That's fair enough. We have a lot of things. Um, well, maybe the word inventor gave it away, but um, it was, in fact, a mathematician called Henri Poincaré. Uh, and I think it, he really summed up for me that, um, that fact that the mathematician is often making choices. Uh, there are infinitely many true statements, but which are the ones that are worth talking about? There are infinitely many pieces of music, but which ones do you want are the ones that play to people? Um, so uh, the, mu the musicians as well recognize that mathematics is an important language for them too. Igor Stravinsky used to talk about his work as inventions, and here he is talking about the musician should find in mathematics a study as useful to him as the learning of another language is to a poet. Mathematics swims just seductively below the surface. So for me, art and science, they're just two parts of the same equation. So, thank you.